Hi guys, welcome to the MD paper of the week. Uh, it's a bit late, uh, so it might not be the most inspired reading uh, you could expect, but um, hopefully we'll we'll find some interesting things in this paper. So for this week, I picked a 2011 paper uh, by Escott, Struper, Sus, uh, and King, um, Australia. Um, it's the main reason why I picked this paper is because it talks about ACMDSD, which is a term introduced by uh, sort of the main book that I've relied a lot in the beginning. Um, and uh, there's not many, um, wh whilst this is a very, very good book, it, it doesn't seem like the ideas that were captured in that book uh, were widespread, were in widespread use. Um, so it's just always refreshing to see somebody actually take it on on those. Um, which picked my interest really. So uh, let's have a quick look at what they have to say for themselves. So the title of the paper is Architecture-Centric Model-Driven Web Engineering. So uh, as we shall see in a minute, ACMDSD, uh, Architecture-Centric Model-Driven Software Development, um, sort of uh, an, an approach of MD that focused more on the architectural s aspects. Uh, and what they propose here is this focus on web engineering. So let's just see what they have for us. Um, so to be adopted by architects, uh, modeling approaches must provide a means of to leverage the software patterns and architectural styles that are relevant to the development practice instead of those prescribed by black box case tools. Okay, interesting. Uh, Architecture-centric model-driven software development is a modeling approach that provides architectural control of the generated application. Right, let's highlight this. I uh, always find it interesting when people start talking about architecture because it's such a difficult to define term. However, AC and DSD primarily focus on the generation infrastructure code. Well, yes, this is very good. So this is clearly what we're interested in. Um, so I'd like to highlight this as well. But for this one, I think probably want a different color. I like with green. We apply ACMDSD to the web engineering and contribute the technique to define and generate system behavior that goes beyond the create, read, update, delete infrastructure functionality. We use UML profiles augmented with OCL to specify the behavior. We provide an example to illustrate the approach and outcomes. So I guess one point we should probably make is uh, put a point here. AC and DSD focuses on infrastructure. Codes. Um, oh, we actually do not mean this kind of note. We meant an org note, a note. So, what we mean by this is. Um, so AC and MDSD captures structural patterns mainly at the architectural level. I do to this, it does not focus on behavior. Authors propose an approach that allows focus but with access to behavior. Let's see how exactly they achieve this. Um, we apply ACM to our engineering contributing technique. Okay, we read this already. Uh, we provide an example to illustrate the approach and outcomes. Okay, so terms model driven, web engineering, AC, MDSD, ML and OCL. So let's have a look at the introduction then. Um, traditionally, model driven approaches are focused on interoperability and software portability. While this, these are important goals, in this paper we focus on development efficiency, software quality, and reusability in specific architectural styles. Specifically, this paper describes an approach to apply model driven software development to multi tier web applications. Alright. For web architectures, the application of a model-driven approach delivers the following advantages. It delivers development efficiency by alleviating repetitive boilerplate programming tasks, 
improves software quality by increasing conceptual clarity and transparency across all artifacts, and provides reusability by encapsulating the core business ideas in the model. Um, I think we probably should highlight this instead. Uh, I think what we're trying to see here is um, uh, yet again we got the wrong highlight somehow. Advantage of any for uh, web apps. So what we're looking for is um, solves the boilerplate problem uh, web applications that have a lot of commonality due to the tier architecture. Then improving software quality by increasing the conceptual clarity and transparency across our artifacts. Well, we really need to see that we're using models all the time, really. Uh, but um, so uh, provides a model level uh, understanding of architecture patterns rather than having them scattered around code artifacts and then um, provides reusability because um, the main concepts are uh, encapsulated in the model it's pretty standard really, but um, architecture-centric model-driven software development can deliver the advantage described above. Stahl and Volter, this is the book I mentioned a second ago, describe AC and DST alongside a two-track development process. In summary, the domain architect track builds the reference implementation first, then the application track abstracts from the reference implementation to create the model and transformations. So. Um, It may seem counterintuitive to um, build the target application first, but this is done with the intention of building many applications using this architecture. So, not too dissimilar to the principles of software product lines. These will be a high; th there will be a higher initial cost that should see return on investment after several projects have been completed. A CMDST expects that only partial generation of the target application occurs, and yeah, this is quite important and that further manual additions will need to be made by a develop developer to complete the application. Let's put this really uh, core idea. Probably a red, because this is very important. Or pink at least. Um, probably should highlight this as well. It gives us a definition of MDSD. Um, figure one um, AC MDSD primarily focuses on generating infrastructure code only. So, figure one depicts the development process used in our research. Let's have a look at figure one. So, handcrafted code and configuration, reference implementation, abstraction. Model UML2 model using profiles, transforms, artifact generation using JET, which is a template language, target web application, generated code, and configuration. Okay, so basically we need a reference implementation and we need to abstract that. Um, firstly, the reference implementation is handcrafted, allowing the architect to control the design of their system. We then abstract um, to the models and transforms by identifying patterns in the reference implementation. Finally, the generated web application is compared against the reference implementation. This process can be repeated until all the requirements are satisfied. So, um, I mean, this is again very standard. Uh, 
Further to the goals of development e efficiency, software quality and usability, there are several added advantages to this process. The generated code is developer readable, the generated code is as good as the reference implementation design and the case tool produces white box. Uh, I quite like these advantages actually. Should we capture this somewhere? In fact, it's a shame that there is no name for this particular process of uh, developing the reference implementation first. Um, let's call it uh, reference implementation driven approach. Uh, the approach recommended by Stahl and Volta not sure I can do the umlaut here, so we'll just go for Volta. Um, start by creating a reference implementation manually and then abstracting the general model based um, implementation. From it, uh, implementation. Uh, it has several. So um, high quality code as a starting point. She's validated up front using regular developer tools. Um, the case tool produces white box. The tooling produced is white box that is developers understand all of it inner workings of the tool unlike in vendor supplied tooling something like this for the purpose of this paper we define case tools as a general term for tools that aid software engineering by generating artifacts from a higher level abstraction but we draw a distinction between white box and black box case tools black box case tools do not provide any architectural control of the generated application and super fundamentality of one size fits all. Okay, this is actually not quite expected for a white box, black box definition, but um, although it does make sense, um, I think this is quite an important thing, so let's just highlight this. So, um, in fact, this might even be a red. The main important point of this highlight is that um, they are focusing on uh, the dependency, the vendor lock-in really. So the generated code is typically unable to be modified and is unreadable. Well, it's not very... I'm not sure if I understand the English here. The generated code is typically unable to be modified and unreadable. Mm, yes, the code is not very readable. If the tool under this tool uses desires to implement some unsupported feature, or there is an issue blocking some progression, they are left at the mercy of the vendor. Really cycles. Okay, very good. Uh, if some extension points are provided, they are generally limited. These are some of the traditional pitfalls of black box case tools. It is, this is opposite to... Ah, okay, so we should really try to capture this, because Dojen is really a white box. Uh, so, white box and black box case. Uh, so black box is where the tool tools hide the internals and provide a limited extensibility API. Uh, users cannot modify or understand the tool at will. White box 
is where there is transparency. Of the inner workings of the tool. Solution is the white box tool. Um, so this is opposed to white box case tools where there is transparency between the higher level abstraction and generated artifacts. Transparency can be achieved by generating readable code with a clear mapping between the higher level abstraction. Right, this is very important. I think in fact I'm even going to quote this. No, actually, yeah, according to the rule method, one should not quote, should always try to write things by own words. So, um, uh, it is important to provide a mapping between the modeling model elements and the generated artifacts, e.g. tracing. Um, at all levels of abstraction. Uh, furthermore, if modifications can be made to the generated code, this frees the user the tool user and opens up a case tool as white box enabling more control. Okay, that's fine. In this paper, we contribute an open and general approach to model-driven web engineering that yields architectural control. Furthermore, we demonstrate a technique to define and generate system behavior that goes further than standard infrastructure code. This is very interesting. Um, in section 2, we compare related work. In section 3, we discuss the architecture patterns of web applications that will be leveraged in the abstraction process. In section 5, we shall show an example to illustrate our approach and we discuss the outcomes in section 6. We conclude in section 7 with a brief description of our future work. So, related work. There have been many web modeling language proposals, including OOHDM, UWE, IDM, WebML, HERA, OOWS, WSDM, and others. All of these approaches provide the model notation to address issues like navigation and presentation. The traditional web application is considered secondary or not published. Very important point here. Uh, this has resulted in proprietary tools such as WebRatio for WebML and HPG for Hera. A well-defined set of models is used only is used by only a single architecture is generated with little control for implementing new outcome, new features for all and generated code. These are examples of black box case tools. Okay, I think this is also very important. Um, oh. I've over highlighted them. I'm going to go for red here. So these are the limitations that we are experiencing. The, there are also tools that have migrated to a model driven architecture approach, which is OOHDMDA for OOHDM and UWE for JSF for UWE. Again, the result is a tool that can generate an application for the given architecture only. Implementing a new architecture in a top-down approach is error-prone and these tools do not provide open and general approaches to follow. Our selection of related work focuses on the following approaches and tools that are backed by case studies and all delivering web applications. So let's have a quick look at what we've got. UWE. UML Web Engineering focuses primarily on navigation and presentation. This is interesting. Uh, this is achieved by a series of model transforms starting with a content model. The following points uh, WebML. Web modeling language was conceived as part of an academic research project that grew into the web ratio industry spin off with a number of business customers. Ruby on Rails, an open source framework with code generation facilities. By deriving defaults by context, this enables allows more concise coding. WebDSL, web domain specific language, uses a high level parser generated tool creating new contextual languages for expressing web applications. The only existing language that is reused is the Ibernet query language. Okay, interesting CHQL here. We have characterized these approaches according to the five categories shown in table one to compare them to the approach printed in this paper. Our approach is represented as ACMDWE in the last row of the table. 
So it's interesting that we're really focusing on separate, singling out web applications rather than thinking about the use cases. So um, probably should say something about that. solely to the design of web applications rather than attempting to generalize the architectural patterns. Just to enable applicability outside of this limited scope. This is part of the issue Virgin tries to address. So in other words, um, I don't think it's a good idea to start talking about things like web application. I mean, what is a web application at the end of the day? Um, if you've got something that has a user interface, why can you not make take advantage of this modeling? So uh, this hard coding is a bit worrying, I think, and we try to avoid that in Dogen. Um, well let's continue then. So, um, OMG meta model. Uh, so, uh, basically, we're now going to have a few dimensions here in terms of what's important. So, uh, what kind of meta model we have, whether it's graphical or textual, whether it's transparent, whether it supports CRUD, whether it doesn't support or it supports more than CRUD. Presumably. Uh, and the following points give the definition of the categories in the above table and a short rationale for choosing our approach. So, OMG meta model. A morph based modeling approach can reuse many tools such as transformation languages, model persistency, frameworks, documentation tools, etc. By using MOF standard, we enable the use of a significant number of tools and increase interoperability. Presumably, you're going to have to justify why we're not using MOF to start off with. Um, graphical textual DSLs. Textual DSLs are good for structure summary presentation, whilst graphical DSLs are useful to visually express intent. We prefer to define our model through a series of diagrams dedicated to business concepts. So, um, I do like the separation here, graphical versus textual. So, again, we always seem to be in the wrong place when we do our notes. Graphical versus textual. So, graphic notation is good for, for expressing intent visually, whereas textual notation is good for structural um, hmm, structure summary presentation. So presumably here we have to quote three. Um, I can like quite this uh, little definition here. So, uh, oh, be careful here with the usual mistake. We prefer to define our model through a series of set of diagrams dedicated to our business concepts. Transparency, the ability to analyze different layers of abstraction, including the code, opens up the case tool to be a white box. This has advantages of a black box case tools where architects have no control over the design of the system. CRUDs, this is usual CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete operations represent the basic system behavior on the main instances. Advanced web frameworks like Ruby on Rails and some academic modeling languages incorporate the means to expressing CRUD. Our first approach must be able to express CRUD to be acceptable to architects. Section VB describes the stereotypes of our profile, the model dysfunctionality. Okay, let's just uh, keep going. Non-CRUD. We categorize all additional system behavior that goes beyond CRUD operations as non-CRUD. This category includes such functionality as the bulk updates, aggregate operations, and drive attributes. Of the four tools surveyed, to provide an escape mechanism. Okay, this is very, very bad use of the word escape. An escape mechanism that includes uncrafted codes from target language uh, in the model. Section VC describes our approach to include 
uh, non cred operations independently of the target language. Okay. Architecture and patterns. So patterns play a central role in any software architecture and AC and DSD leverages this in the abstraction process. For readers who are unfamiliar with the web architectures, we briefly discuss the patterns that influenced influence our metamodels and enable us to create transparency between the models and the code. Three the three main architectural styles are pattern and patterns we leverage are multi tier model view controller and domain driven design. So as you can see here, this is really, I mean, you can use this in any way, really. It's nothing to do with the web. It just happens that we use it in the web. So a multi-tier architecture is usually made up of three or more tiers. And in our example, we use the following four tiers. Persistent tier, persistence tier, tier, web tier, and presentation tier. The persistent tier typically stores and receives data from a database. The business tier mediates between the persistence tier and the upper tiers by using the domain model and performs the business logic. The web tier consists of the controllers, backing forms and validation cases. The presentation tier is responsible for the final render of the HTML to be returned to the client browser. Okay, um, let's just highlight this bit here. The domain model is a term used to describe a set of classes that represent the core business concepts and logic. This is all typical Evans DDD stuff. So don't need to uh, delay ourselves too much here. DDD encapsulates this idea by specifying the use of an entity pattern and a manager service pattern. Well, this is a bit, bit of a stretch really. Evan stocks a lot more than this, but an entity is a simple class with private fuels that has accesses and mutators. A manager is responsible for business operations or activities and has no states. Figure 2 shows a partial ML class diagram of a single entity. In general, each entity has a corresponding manager. Okay, I'm not entirely sure this is really a bit of a mischaracterization of DDD, really. Most web application frameworks are based on MVC. Its main strength is the separation of concerns whereby the model holds data and defines business logic. Um, okay. View objects are used to make web pages. Controller objects mediate between the model and the view. And in general, terms for web architectures, the domain model is the M, the presentation tier is the V, and the web tier is the C for the MVC pattern. In this section, we have briefly discussed the architecture and patterns we use in our reference implementation. The architecture we use is our preferred approach to building web applications and is what we consider best practice. However, some other architects may believe that the best practice is an alternate solution or they may wish to use a different programming language or web application framework. In this circumstance, ACM DST has an advantage because the development process always begins with the reference implementation. So architects have control of the design of their system and do not need to buy into a black box case tool. Okay, uh, sadly I, I think that yeah, this is a very misguided idea that um, one can just extract the architectural patterns and then just retarget things. But uh, in addition, if a separate organization wishes to reuse an existing ACM DST solution as they agree with the, arch uh, the architecture, they will receive a white box case tool that they can further develop as needed. Okay, that, that I don't disagree. I think that's a very good point. Abstraction of the patterns uh, for reuse is not a invalid goal. This section is a background information for the reader without knowledge of MG standards. In section 4a, we briefly introduce UML profiles in section 4b, OCL. Okay, let's just quickly scan through this. UML profiles. UML is a general purpose modeling language by the Object Management Group. It is possible to refine UML using profiles which are lightweight language extensions. Stereotypes are used to mark UML model elements. Information associated with stereotype element can be programmatically used. This makes your model more useful as information specific to problem and can be included. Okay. Uh, object constraint language. Object constraint language OCL augments uh, EML to make more precise models. OCL is an expression language used to describe invariance pre and post conditions. It combines first order logic with object graph navigation. It's possible to transform OCL into other languages such as Java or SQL. Uh, let's just highlight these two points here. They're well known, but still. In our example, we draw some OCL to either SQL or HQL. Example. In our example, we apply AC and DST to web engineering and follow an iterative two track development process. The domain architecture track involves developing the reference implementation as described in section 5a. In parallel, we develop our model and transformations on the application track. 
as described in section 5b and section 5c. The domain architecture track is typically one iteration in front of the application track, allowing time for the reference implementation to be built. Okay, we should really direct, write a critique of this approach because uh, I don't entirely agree with this. Um, uh, so, to track uh, development approach, uh, we should write a critique of this approach and why we have chosen is still its principles, but not partake and the exact approach in Doge. Um, should be enough to remind us of what we're trying to say here. But the idea is that um, Doge tries to extract the fundamental principles so they can reuse them in other projects. Whereas here we're trying to say that the, the two track approach is built specifically for this project uh, and then uh, when it will be extracted it's extracted for the product family rather than a slightly more generic sort of uh, approach uh, this needs to be explained properly really so a reference implementation our example involves building a reference implementation project called stickers rock an e-commerce website that sells stickers we have two other projects that do not have reference implementations and used to validate our approach okay very good point Front Edge, a webs video website, Front Edge, a video website, and Mule Punting, a betting website. Okay, I quite like this idea. Um, uh, the software architecture is briefly described in section 3. The main technology is using a Spring, Hibernate, and Java service pages, USP, Java server pages. Uh, figure 3 shows a partial domain model for stickers, rock and provides the reader with an insight to the structure of the website. The other two projects are discuss, uh, discussed in section 6. Presumably something quite common, we need a cart, a product, line item, a brand, contact, or rather a trivial model really. The stickers rock class diagram shown in figure 3 contains six entities that represent the core of its business domain. A website can user can browse products by category and place them into a shopping cart. To support CRUD functionality, the web application provides two pages for each domain entity. There's also one-to-one -one mapping here, really. The left, so one, two, two mapping. The left-hand side, the left-hand tile is a partial screen capture that allows users to create a new product or select a product to view, edit, or delete. For all operations except delete, the right-hand tile displays the details. Form validation is an integral part of web application. Uh, web developers must ensure that the data input by the user is validated for correctness. Given the importance of form validation, it must be considered a part as part of molding a solution to web development. Hence the OCL. Another paper describes how we include form validation. So, uh, so the here we were focusing on the reference implementation. Now we go into the abstract process, abstraction process. The abstraction process from the reference implementation to the model and transformation is depicted in Figure One. The application, actually, I'm sure we've seen figure one. Um, the application track creates the model and transformations that generate the target web application. Here we identify patterns that in the software architecture of the reference implementation and use these as a basis for our model. Again, this is all very standard. Um, we implement this track using UML2 or CL and JET2 components of the Eclipse modeling project. Across our four-tier architecture, we had to create a total of 15 handwritten files for two pages in Figure 4. Similar files were required for the domain entities. To infer our profile, we chose the MVC as the basis for our model. Table 2 maps the 15 uncrafted files to the MVC pattern. So we just basically went through each of the files they created and where they sit in terms of MC, MVC and where they are in terms of the UML diagram and profile. So a JET2 template is created for each of the 15 files in table 2. The code for each file is copied into the template. So we don't really use this approach. We try to do things as we go along. Um, we should also defend this approach. Parts of the code that will change between generations are identified and replaced by a JET2 tag. This is sometimes referred to as elegant text replacement. For example, the question of a class is always the same 
We're dealing with the class changing between different classes. So leaving the class declaration and replacing the name with a variable allows many classes to be generated from a template with different class names. We use a multi-stage transformation process. Right, so do we. So again, let's capture this. This was uh, 21. Presumably this is going to be star. Yes. Let's just put a note here. Bibliography. Find a multi stage transformation process page one eighty eight in style. Even though we're using the same approach, we should probably make sure we're compliant with what Stahler said. Um, in the first step, we programmatically create the model and store the data as XML. We then pass the XML to the templates for code generated. Mm, okay, we don't really like XML, that's fine. Our YAML diagrams are named input M, input V, and input C. The diagram names start with inputs to indicate that they are used as inputs to a transformation process. Each diagram ends with the letter corresponding to MVC pattern. Um, bit of Hungarian notation. Uh, in addition, the three UML profiles are created. Each profile is applied to the corresponding input diagram. Input M is a UML class diagram. Figure 3 is part of input M diagram. Each entity in the diagram has a corresponding manager not shown in this figure. Figure 2 shows the manager for the product entity. Uh, one thing we should probably mention is... Um, let's put a note here on DDD. DDT entity uh, pattern and manager service. Uh, we, we need to review Evans DDT on entity pattern and manager. Uh, if what this paper says is correct. This would be very amenable to cogeneration because we separate behavior manager from structure entity. Now I'm pretty sure uh, there was more details to what Evan said, but uh, we will look at that later. Um, now then. Uh, Profile M, seen in figure 5, specifies the stereotypes that can be applied to input M. The two stereotypes, entity and manager, are used to indicate if a class from input M is either entity or a manager. The arrow with the solid head indicates an extension in UML profiles, i.e. the entity and manager stereotypes can be applied to a class, not a property. The other stereotypes in this profile are explained in the next text section. Input V is a UML class diagram. Each class and diagram represents a page element in on the user interface. In principle, this is similar to Connellan's approach to model user interface using UML and is being replicated by many web modeling languages. Okay. Perhaps we should visit Connell. Connellan's. Our profile is different and presented here for clarity. We acknowledge that the profile does not cover all of the possible HTML 401 elements. We have kept it reduce size to limit the scope of the example. Profile V, as seen in figure 6, specifies the stereotypes that can be applied to input V. A page is composed of many elements. So really what we're trying to do here is we have different representations on our multi-stage pipeline. Each of the representations corresponds to one of the tiers of the architecture. We transform uh, the model as we go across this pipeline. Uh, and this is not really our approach. We instead propose, uh, in fact, to be honest, we probably should say this. Um, uh, the approach in Dogen is to flatten the multi stage pipeline into an heterogeneous meta model. Um, we should describe in detail the differences between approaches. It's a bit difficult 
to explain in five seconds, but uh, it does make sense. Um, <coughs> now then, um, we are kind of already at 40 minutes, so we need to start going a bit quicker. Um, so, uh, a page is composed of many elements. It has an optional entity property used to indicate if this page is backed by an entity from input N. This convention is used so our transformations can correctly generate the target application. An element has three subclasses, label, button, and backing. Label and button are used to represent the equivalent HTML 401 elements. The backing property properties type and name are required by all subclasses for submission via an HTML form, so we're doing some kind of binding here. If the name property from backing mismatches the same name of property belonging to page entity, then the backing is entity property is derived true and the page is populated with this data. Uh, yeah, okay. The convention links input V and input M. Uh, the out stereotype is used to output the value of an entity's property while a label outputs static text. So we kind of designed the form. The select box is included as an example of a custom element. In figure 4, a product can be assigned many categories. The select box is rendered as two list boxes with two buttons adding and removing a selection. Input C is your most set machine diagram. Every page in the web application has two states, stereotyped as client side and service side. The transitions are stereotyped as request, response and redirect. This enables the website navigation to be modeled. Okay, uh, very interesting. It's kind of what we expect I guess. But, um, let's highlight here as well. The state transitions can be further stereotyped as seen in figure 7. Right, server side, product list controller, client side, product list page. So we're basically doing the kind of communication between the client and the server side. Using the three diagrams described above, we are able to generate the deployable CRUD style enabled web application comparable to the reference implementation. We test the generated application using model based testing, and then the paper describes this process. Uh, one thing we should probably do as well is um, we need to refer to this paper because we are doing model based testing. Uh, so we need paper 8. Um, uh, we are using model based testing in Dojen, so we need find uh, literature for this okay it should give us a good starting point um, let's make sure we highlight it Um, we acknowledge that some of the details were omitted in this paper and we hope we have presented enough detail here for an overall understanding of the abstraction process. Understanding how all the pieces fit together using templates in the simplest form is by elegant test replacement using the reference implementation. Of the three diagrams, input C has the least amount of detail. This diagram is important to navigation and security. Stereotypical data manipulation. While crude based features cover a large portion of what needs to be modeled to define a data driven website, other common behavior cannot be modeled. We accept that it is infeasible to provide the ability to model every possible non-crude feature, as the model will be quite verbose and has the same complexity as code. However, we have found that certain non-crude features are stereotypical and occur frequently. This is what we call scraps, really. Consequently, our approach includes a method to add such stereotypical non-crude behavior to the profile. In this section, we determine, demonstrate this method for three stereotypical non crude behaviors called bulk, aggregate, and formula. On the left hand side of figure 4, the user has the option to increase the price of all products. This behavior, this type of behavior, is a bulk update. The, on the, left, the left hand side of figure 8 shows the common aggregate values calculated over all shopping carts. This type of behavior is an aggregate. The right hand side displays a table of products purchased and totals. The totals are the right values and stereotype with formula. Each of the three stereotypes, aggregate, bulk, and formula, use OCL to specify a post-condition expression or any variant. An aggregate or a bulk stereotype can be applied to an operation from a manager class. A formula stereotype can be applied to an entity property. Stereotypes are defined in profile M, shown in figure 5. The total property on the card's entity is stereotype formula in the OCL, as shown below. 
to solve for this formula is transforming to SQL and included. See, I don't particularly like the fact that we're transforming model entities directly into SQL. Um, and including entities abnet mapping. In the target application, the card total will now be available as a property on the class and can be displayed on the page. So presumably we are now converting OCL to the HQL. Uh, the, the get some card total operation in the card manager in figure 9 is the type aggregate and the OCL shown below. The OCL is transformed into HQL, there we go, and included uh, in the persistence TM. The manager operation can now return the result aggregate to be displayed on the user interface. This is done by an adding an out stereotype class to input V. Specifically, the inherited property name from backing is set to some card total, and this is mapped to the card manager's operation get some to card total. This is wired together by the controller, making it possible to display aggregates on any page. This convention links the result from manager operations to user interface elements. Okay, I'm not quite sure this is a good idea, but. Um, the increased increased product price operation in the product manager figure 2 is served type bulk and the OCL shown below. So basically, I mean, we're getting the gist of it. We got some OCL, this OCL is mapped, we generate some HQL for the OCL, and that then is used directly. Um, it's really not what we would like to see, but uh, the operation increases the price in all products. Similar to the aggregate to OCL, this is to HQL to be included in the persistence tier on the application and is wired together via the controller. The operations parameter percentage is matched to an element of input V with the same name. It's conventional exclusive. So basically we're using names as a way to link everything together. We have several conventions there. Oh, there we go. Uh, right, I think this is probably something really important. Uh, so basically we're relying a lot on coding by convention. Which may be a good thing, maybe a bad thing. However, we recognize that our approach can be improved by model checking to ensure that the conventions are followed, yes. Currently, a typing error can be undetected until late in the transformation process and could be caught early on with model checking. Okay, discussion. Excuse me. In our case study, we built three projects using the reference implementation of the first project. Table 3 summarizes our findings using the following columns. The main model entities represent the total number of classes in the main model. Handwritten files are manually coded with total lines in code brackets dot lines of code in brackets. Model size as three numbers separated by forward slash representing primary elements in the model view and controller diagrams respectively. Templates created are chat to templates created to generate target application and generated files are the total files generated with the total lines of code in brackets. The first project requires 71 handwritten files and 18 transformation templates to be created. In the second and third project we want to generate the target application we now need to handwrite any files or create any new transformation templates. This could also mean that um, clearly the two projects were very, very closely related, the three projects. Um, by covering CRUD and some non-CRUD behavior in the first project, we were able to generate the second and third projects without the need for any handwritten code. However, this not exclude the possibility that extra functionality will need to be introduced in subsequent projects. Whenever new requirements are introduced, we have not previously being generalized with the reference implementation, a choice needs to be made. If the new requirement is specific only to this project and there is little benefit in adding to the reference implementation, then the requirement is manually coded into the native application. Right, I would like to really highlight all of this because this is really what we're trying to do with Dogen. Um This is really when you're using Dogen, you how you should look at the world. Uh, on the other hand, if it's foreseen that the new requirement may print in subsequent projects, it should be added to the reference implementation. The ACMBSD approach thus allows us to incrementally consider new categories of system behavior. Let's see. ACMBSD approach with regards to extensibility. Patterns for the chain is expected to be done organically. This we share in common with MD, MC, MD, MC, as this in this paper. 
for us to go back to. Um, in the current implementation places, the current implementation places non-crude features in the persistent tier as SQL or HQL queries, i.e. we transform the OCL into either SQL or HQL. Alternatively, the non-crude functionality could have been a store procedure or alternatively um, in the business tier as a transaction. In practice, many factors are considered when an architect places the functionality. So a modeling approach must provide a mechanism to allow choices between implementation strategies. Um, this is quite important. Various variation points I will consider in software product lines and as part of future work we will consider variation points in ACM DST. Okay. Uh, perhaps slightly more important. Conclusions. In this paper we have demonstrated an approach to architecture centric more driven software development for web applications that is based on a UML profile and OCL expressions. The specification of the approach in terms of YAML and OCL provides transparency with regards to code generation. At the same time, the approach adopts the point of view of architects and thereby lowers the barrier of adoption of the model-driven method. The demonstrated approach is open to extension based on requirements. Additional stereotypical fun stereotypical functionality can be included interactively, iteratively. In this paper, we have described this process for three new stereotypes. This enables architects to gain the savings of model-driven automation for frequently required elements beyond the common crude operations. So far our approach provides a fixed translation of features from OCL to the underlying languages. Consequently the implementation is always placed in the same tier of the architecture. Okay. Recognize that this does not reflect the important aspect of architectural activity. Architects realize features in different tiers of the architecture based on non-functional requirements of the project. Hmm. This is a bit of a problem, really. Uh, let's highlight this. Um, architects realize features in different tiers of the architecture based on non-functional requirements of the project. One aspect of feature work will look into the specification implementation of such architecture variation points. Our approach provides adequate support if the model based infrastructure is used consistently for extension. Realize that this requirement will not often not be met. Consequently, we are interested in means to inspect again another very crucial point. Uh, consequently, we are interested in means to inspect the integrity of the application, even if it has been altered on the implementation level for purposes of extension. We aim to explore the automated generation of model-based testing suite that can accompany the application. We intend to evaluate the effectiveness of such a suite either against manually seeded or automatically injected faults. Acknowledgements. We'd like to thank the University of Queensland for their support with the Australian Postgraduate Award. Okay, so that was uh, quite an interesting paper. Um, I mean, one m one of the points I'd like to make is that I, I I'm not a big fan of the whole web tier and web web application and so on. I think we need to be able to extract the patterns that these applications have from a higher level, such that you can create any application, whether it's web or not that uses the same architecture. And to be fair, um, perhaps the, the, the authors would have done the same, and maybe it was just the case that web was the sort of the buzzword at the time, so they focused on that. Uh, but other than that, I think there's quite a lot of interesting points here, and quite a lot of things that are going to make uh, their appearance in Dogen as well. So I think this is definitely a very useful worthwhile paper. Uh, okay, I think that's all for today.